we have a real treat for you tonight. We have uh, Kathy Mason is bringing us Dave Barnett. And he's going to be talking about the Akashic Records and past lives. So before we get to the real exciting part where I don't talk anymore, I'm going to show a very short video that'll give folks who are new to the Co-Creators Convergence a little idea of who we are and how we got started. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Mason now. And uh, Kathy is going to introduce our guest, and we shall begin. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Noelle. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, my other friends in Co-Creators Convergence. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited to be part of this today. I am the second choice. Uh, Shirley Bullstock was the, the original interviewer host and I'm the second league, but I'm lucky. I feel myself very fortunate to get to talk to Dave Barnett again. Um, Dave the Mystic is really truly, I, I do have a bio for him, but he really is a rocket scientist. He is really that smart, <laughs> but he also is quite connected to multiple realms and can assist people in so many ways. Um, what I'd like to do is just read a little bit about Dave, just so that you know something about him. And then I'll do a centering um, after, after we just say hi for a second. So um, Dave, in 1983, he had a life-changing event and started delving into the many areas of metaphysics and focused on energy healing. In 1999, the big hands came down again. And since then he has had many spiritual gifts present themselves, including advanced healing methods, shamanic journeying and soul splinter return, past life reading, working with core beliefs and performing energy clearings. And I'll be putting the information of how to connect with Dave in the chat and on Facebook, because we really know he's a huge resource for everyone right now. So Dave, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's fun to be here. Yes, yes. I'm looking forward to it. Yes. Well, um, I did contact Shirley, so I did get a little cheat sheet of what she would have asked you, <laughs> uh, besides what I want to know. Um, so so we'll, hopefully it'll be fun for you, and there are no wrong answers, and we appreciate your energy and your assistance so much in these times. Everyone seems to be, everything's speeding up. Yes, and some absolutely. of us are kind of turning into jello. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd love to do, though, just to center for everyone that's here and everyone that's on Facebook is use my Akashic Records opening prayer um, that I read it three times and then uh, make sure we're in. And then that way that might help Dave work with Akashic Records, too. So here we go. We align with our divine primordial blueprint with guidance from the galactic Akashic records in all dimensions. All aspects of self are here now. All universal and celestial information and all important memories for our highest good and guidance 
are available to us now. We have access to all stellar wisdom of light now, delivered by the galactic Akashic Record Keepers in reverence for the well being of all life. And so it is. We align with our divine primordial blueprint with guidance from the galactic Akashic Records in all dimensions. All aspects of self are here now. All universal and celestial information and all important memories for our highest good and guidance are available to us now. We have access to all stellar wisdom of light now, delivered by the galactic Akashic Record Keepers in reverence for the well being of all life. And so it is. One more. You can feel the energy coming in. We align with our divine primordial blueprint with guidance from the galactic Akashic records in all dimensions. All aspects of self are here now. All universal and celestial information and all important memories for our highest good and guidance are available to us now. We have access to all stellar wisdom of light now, delivered by the galactic Akashic record keepers in reverence for the well-being of all life. And so it is. Masters, teachers, and guides, please show us what we need to know. Okay, we're in. Boy, Dave, you got some energy. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> so, so Dave, why don't you, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little insight into your journey before I ask you questions, I think I said you are a rocket scientist. I mean, you obviously use your analytical brain. You're, you're able to use both sides of your brain. You don't stay just in your left <laughs> side no. with the work you do and your way in your heart so so you must have gone through your classic education and and um job profession yes. and then what what caused you to go to the woo-woo side <laughs> well uh, I'm, I'm one of those lucky people that i knew what i wanted to be as a child in fifth grade, I discovered electronic circuits and electronic parts, and that was when uh, integrated circuits were first coming oh. out where hobbyists could obtain them. Mm -hmm. And um, I became a ham radio operator in junior high, uh, talking to people around the world with uh, Morse code. I, I was fixing TVs for neighbors. I was already disassembling old TVs to harvest the parts. Uh, to uh, build up my own uh, junk box full of parts that I could experiment with. I just had this overall driving need to know how did circuits work? How, how, what do schematics really mean? And I, I ended up getting my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering at Kansas State. And then I went to Michigan and got my master's. Uh, along the way, I decided I wanted to sort of specialize in bioengineering. And so my, my master's focused on uh, bioelectrical sciences, the nervous system, the brain, uh, as well as cool. still picking up the electrical theory. Uh, I came out of uh, Michigan. I worked for General Motors uh, for a couple of years, decided I was tired of Michigan and really didn't like General Motors. And I moved back to Wichita and worked for Boeing for a couple of years. And uh, that was a good introduction to aerospace. Uh, but it certainly wasn't the end thing. And after a couple of years there, I decided I wanted to move on. And Martin Marietta, based in Denver, came through town and hired. And so I moved out to Denver in 1981. And I ended up working for Martin Marietta for about 20 years and then went on to other engineering positions and other things. Um, but uh, one of the big turning points for me in 1983, now, uh, a little bit more background. Uh, my parents, uh, my, my dad was... Uh, an industrial engineer, and then he became an Episcopal priest. And then he um, he had some challenges, I'll say, you can all just leave it to your speculation. And he had to leave the priesthood in uh, at the time I was 11 and my parents divorced. And 
some point after that, my mom got curious and went with a friend to have an astrology reading, and she thought it'd be very superficial and just kind of a lark. And uh, the astrologer was very serious and told her things like, uh, I see you broke your left arm when you were five years old. Uh, you, you have a probably have a mole on your upper right thigh. And my mom got hooked. She said, I have to find out how this works, kind of like me. And uh, I have three older brothers who uh, would not have anything to do with that stuff with my mom. But so I became sort of the, the guinea pig when she wanted to try the ESP prediction cards, like the Ryan cards. Uh, we did uh, the Ouija board, which uh, obviously I discourage anybody from using now. Um, <laughs> we tried table, table tipping. Uh, we did other things. And so I was open to the idea of ESP and metaphysics, but I wasn't actively pursuing it by any means. So fast forward to 1983, I go to my 10th high school reunion uh, back in Wichita. I run into an old friend and he said, Dave, did you become an electrical engineer like you expected? And I said, yeah. And he said, do you think it's possible to change things at a distance? And he kept beating around the bush. And I said, come on, out with it. What's going on? He said, no, I'd rather show you. So he said, come over to my house after the picnic. So I rode with him over to his house. We got to his house. And the first thing he did was uh, we, uh, he walked me up to the electric meter on his house. And he said, do you have an idea of uh, the, the rate of the spin of the wheel? And the, basically, the, the more power you're using at any instant in time, the faster the wheel spins. And that's how they keep track of your power usage. And uh, I said, yeah, I, I can see that. And he points at it and he goes, now, and it slows down by a third. And he said, I did that to my mother's house several months ago and her bills are still lower. Uh, well, okay, you got my attention. <laughs> yeah. So we, we go inside the house and he has a little black and white TV on rabbit ears and in Wichita at that time, there were only four transmitted channels and he puts the TV on a, on a non-station channel. So it's just snow. And then he points at the TV and he says now, and he tunes in a station on the TV. Uh, well, this is getting very interesting. Um, we go over to a stereo and uh, he's a disc jockey in an FM radio station. He has a very nice stereo and it has uh, the VU meters with the needles and uh, he's playing music. He said, do you see how the needles are moving with the music? I said, sure. You know, the music gets louder, the needle goes up. It gets softer, the needle goes down. He points at the stereo and goes now, and the needles go out of phase with the music, such that when the music gets louder, the needles go down. And when it gets softer, they go up. Okay, this is getting very interesting. Uh, he said, let me show you something in my car now. And we go out, we sit in this car, he starts it, leaves it idling. This is conventional ignition. Feet and hands are off the controls. And he sort of points at the engine and goes now. And the engine slows down to the point where it's stalling. And he said, I can install other cars in traffic. And it's like, wow, uh, that's pretty cool. Now that's one of those things that everybody liked to have that, you know, and wouldn't we all love to be able to stall cars in traffic? And not really, not if said, you're in front let, of Let's you. do one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, if they're tailgating you, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do it that way. So we, we go, so we, we go to his radio station and we go in the back door and we, we go to the room where they have the, the meters uh, so they can see the status of the transmitter. And there's one meter that's digital and it's reading 99.6, which means 99.6% of the rated 50,000 watts is going out the antenna. And he said, I can lower the power of the transmitter, but he said, I have to be careful because if I lower it too much, it'll trip off the air. It thinks there's a fault. So he said, I'm gonna lower it a little bit. So you see the meter. I said, yeah, it's 99.6, rock solid. And he points at it and he goes now and drops to 99.2. Well, four tenths of a percent of 50,000 watts is a lot of power to control your mind. You know, most, most accounts I've read of uh, psychokinesis, it's very small effects, a very sensitive apparatus, a, a beam hanging on a string and a bell jar so no air currents can affect it and they make it turn just a little bit. Yeah. And here I've he is that. manipulating hundreds or thousands of watts. And uh, it forced me to come back to Denver and say, okay, I feel like the big hands just came down and said, Dave, you're an electrical engineer. I just gave you a demo that you can't ignore. 
right. you know, this is in your field, you know, you can't be faking it. And um, I said, okay, this, this puts me on a path where uh, I was trying to run out of answers in electrical engineering about how life works. And this put me on a new path. And I got involved wow. with uh, taking classes in psychic development. I got involved in uh, energy healing through therapeutic touch. I got involved in meditation classes. I got involved with a group called the Tibetan Foundation that was teaching how to do channeling of ascended masters. And I just really started pushing on from there. And while I still, you know, as some of my friends joke about me, you know, you're like Clark Kent and Superman. So during <laughs> yeah. the day, you're, you're the mild-mannered engineer out at Martin Marietta at night, you know, you're <laughs> Superman going off and zooming and doing this stuff. So, so cool. Um, it, it, it just continued to move forward. Uh, about 1999, uh, in readings, I was getting, because uh, I, I got periodic readings just to check up what am I missing? What do I need to hear from uh, advanced spiritual beings? I said, it's time, time to step up, time to up your game. I, I left uh, Martin in uh, 2000, went to a small uh, engineering company, and I was there for about three years. And uh, about 2002, I really started intensively uh, meditating with uh, specific uh, spiritual growth goals. And in 2003, I won some uh, independent contracts from the Air Force for research and development. And... Uh, the voice came down in my head and said, okay, Dave, you have all the money you need, all the time you need, go out and learn everything you can about healing. And so I left the engineering company because I had this other work. And uh, I, I learned about eight or nine different healing modalities. I took two years of psychic development with a Denver medium. Uh, I even went to acupuncture school for a couple terms. Gifts started appearing. Uh, it became very easy for me to do the past life uh, it started out as a model, you know, in a meditation where I'd see a big book on a stand, I could open it, and I'd see a picture that would turn into a video, and then I could get all the context out of that, and I found I could move the video forwards and backwards in time. That migrated eventually to being in the spiritual plane and going to the Hall of Records and having books handed to me that represent lifetimes of clients, and then that just finally went to a point where it's clear cognizant now. I set the intention of what I need to know about a past lifetime for a person, and I just get downloads. It just, uh, the, the information or the data is there. Other gifts started coming through. Uh, one that's kind of peculiar is uh, in one of my meditations, I was in the courtyard of a castle and opened up a trapper and they took me down some steps and I was in what looked like a dungeon. And we went down a long corridor and I was with some uh, uh, spiritual beings and hit a big door and they unlocked it and opened it up and there's somebody in there being tortured and i said what am i supposed to understand out of this and they said this is a person in their own personal hell basically there is no objective hell but if you die and you think there's a hell you have an image of it and you think you belong there the co-creator in you you know just works with the creator and just says yes and these people may be in these personal hells for three or four or 500 years until they finally get to the point where they say, frankly, is this all there is? And an angel will step in and say, yeah. well, you could go to heaven anytime you want it. But they said, we want you to develop a, a protocol for returning these souls to heaven. And so I, I did develop one. And uh, basically, I stood them up, cleaned them up, hosed them off put them in fresh clothes, took them into a conference room next door, gave them a nice big glass of water, sat them at a conference table and the spiritual beings and I sat on the other side and started explaining the facts of life to them. And to prove it, um, I would have them stand up and grab a torch off a wall and open that door and look out. And now that it was just a void, that there was not, nothing left of the, the torture scenario. And uh, that would usually convince them. And then they'd agree to go to the spiritual plane and be sort of reunited, repatriated, uh, uh, reconciled with those that uh, they'd hurt or who had hurt them. And um, I, I've done these same types of scenarios for people who die and they think there's a purgatory or who die and they think there's a limbo or they die and they think there's other levels of hell or, or initiation rites that they have to pass before they get to the spiritual plane. Uh, all those types of things. And so that, that's another gift that came through. Uh, another one that came through uh, about four or five years ago was uh, karma burning. 
And in my spiritual journeys, I was taken to meet somebody named, very ordinary named George. And he was in a glass house and he showed me that he could burn karma on people, burn all the karma for all lives. I said, this is great. Can I do this? And he said, yeah, that's why you're here. I want to teach you how to do it. So I, I have uh, one of my services I offer for people is to completely burn all karma for all lives. And I have a guided Please. meditation. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're done with that. I, I, I truly believe that with our spiritual evolution, awesome. we're, we're reaching the end of karma. Uh, we, we don't have the time span in front of us of thousands of years for people to do something like Joe shoots Bob. Okay. Now Joe needs to come back and be the victim. Yeah. Now Joe needs to come back and be Bob's mother to see what it's like to lose a son. We, we don't have that time now for, right. for replaying all these scenarios. So well, uh, I truly see that karma is going away. I don't know that it's yeah. that we don't have time as much as that we don't have the need. I think yes. that, that yeah. we've been so many different um, uh, actors <laughs> in these plays that um, mm -hmm. at this point, this is this is a time. Well, I I wonder if you agree with this that this is a time to um, embody yes more of our soul. A absolutely, um, I, I think we're the subject of interest for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ET races who are curious about how we're going to make this evolutionary jump. And some of them are very helpful. Some are just passive observers. A few of them are negative, uh, but for the most part, they're, they're either helpful or passive. And they want to be here on the scene when we do this. Right. Uh, you know, here we are moving from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. And, uh, you know, technically astronomers and astrologers don't, they, they aren't able to determine a specific year when that happens. Right. But I, I feel that, you know, in the past several years, especially starting with 2012, uh, we're clearly moving into it uh, with, with both feet on the ground and uh, for all the implications of what the age of Aquarius is going to mean for us. Well, you have an incredible reputation for being the guy that can solve the, um, the energy issues that no one else can. Um, I was on <laughs> really, because you have so many, you're, 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 uh, repertoire is so big with all the things you've studied. You you do psyche, you do akashic records, you do energy healing, you do you work with all the ETs. Um, and I was on a call, which your ears should have been burning, um, with the woman Mary Edwards. <laughs> do you know who she is? Oh yes. Okay. Absolutely. Well, yeah. she was going on and on. Okay, they were talking about alien implants. And um, this people were talking about this one gentleman that was being interviewed. She was on like a panel. There was a, an author being interviewed. And then she was in, in the panel that was supposed to be asking questions. But she kept going talking about you, um, which was very <laughs> nice. Um, and she said her father took classes with Einstein, that she worked in the aerospace industry in California. Yeah. Um, and she said that she had an implant in her third eye that was a Palladian implant, and you were the only person who could help her with it. I was asking about Mary Edwards and her, her uh, implants. Yes. Um, I, I found over the years that people do have implants. They used to be physical. Now they're mostly energetic, and I find that about one-third of the ones I discover are helpful and two-thirds are controlling or negative and need to be removed and uh, she had one that was sort of uh, holding off her third eye capabilities and that needed to be uh, cleared for her and uh, one of the things I've discovered in, in my energy and entity clearing work is you have to be very careful in removing implants no matter what their character because they frequently have what looks like uh, I characterize as looking like philodendron tendrils going into the body oh. Uh -huh. And uh, I learned the lesson on when, when they take out your appendix, they put a Teflon sleeve around the appendix and uh, before they snip it and then they pull it out. And so it all slides out intact. And 
I kind of do that energetically. I put a Teflon bag around these tendrils so that when I remove these implants, I, I don't leave any pieces behind. I, I've heard anecdotal stories of uh, people removing these and leaving a chunk behind, and it actually causes physical symptoms. Well, so why so do you think So good implants she... that, that might help your third eye. Right, right. That's what I wanted to know is, it, uh, do you feel like these are like being tagged by your, by ET so they're, they can find you anywhere or are they human enhancements? Some are, some are enhancements. Some are treatments like your tags on cattle and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, who are you? What are you doing? Where are you going? Uh, where we're going to interfere with your life. Um, there's a, a lot of beings that co in, cohabitate with us in our space at a slightly different vibration, and they are aware of us where we aren't necessarily aware of them. Uh, I mean, you, you see that on those pictures of uh, spacecraft that fly into the side of a mountain, and they adjust their vibration, and they go right into the mountain. They're going to a different space, and uh, I find that there are... Um, other dimensional beings that hang around our houses and watch us. They're curious about how we live, how we process stuff. And <laughs> ah! during my clearing, during my clearing, I, I moved those on. Um, they're, 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 they're curious about us. We have free will. They don't, they've evolved past emotions. We have emotions. Um, they're, they're just kind of lurking. And um, so I, I kind of feel that's uh, that's uh, send them back to where they come. Well, um, there was a Boulder Exo event that a lady came that was going to speak at Guy TV, and she had implants all along her chest and all down her spine, and they when you, uh, ma when you put a magnet towards it, it stuck to her skin. <laughs> Wow. And she and um, so they were physical and um, they talked about trying, you know, did she want them to be re you know, removed because they sh I guess they showed up on x-ray even and she said no she loved them yeah. she loved the beings that had brought them she loved everything about it she felt great with them so so you know, who knows because there's so many beings that are in our space right now. I'm also test on, on many things for level of consciousness using the David Hawkins power versus force scale. Uh, I test for quantities of things. I test for when are things going to show up. And, uh, you know, when I test for how many uh, different ET races are hanging around our planet right now, I get over 340. Yep. And, and so, you know, when people say, well, is it Pleiadian Arcturian? It's like, who knows? It, it's it's spelled X Y G G G. Can you pronounce that? I don't know, and uh, I don't I don't worry about trying to name them anymore. It's uh, just uh, too tedious almost. Well, it's actually fun, but it, it's fun because it it just expands your thought, but it isn't realistic because nobody really knows. So it's almost hearsay. A lot of the details, like Tom Kenyon's book on the Arcturians, mm -hmm. or some of these books, they, they, they all conflict with information. So, yeah. so well, the, there's, there's a couple of properties like rural properties that I've cleared where the, the people feel very achy and nervous on their property. You know, it might be a, a quarter section of land and I'll find that near the farmhouse. Um, there, there's a group of ETs underground that have uh, sort of like an outpost and there may be 20 or 30 of them there. And, wow. I was talking to one person, I said, you know, they may be hiding in plain sight occasionally. And right about then, this uh, big old time sedan drives by with a whole bunch of people in it, all staring at her. And she goes, oh my God, I've never seen those before in plain sight. And, uh, you know, or they may dress very outlandishly, so you'll be embarrassed to stare. And, you know, they're there in a fluorescent pink, you know, raincoat and, and yellow rubber boots. And you, you just, uh, oh, you know, must be somebody who's, you know, a little bit off. And it's like, no, it's a good guys. That yeah. might be fashionable in their, in their quadrant. 
Um, <laughs> um, so <laughs> Noelle, Noelle's been writing some questions. One of the things she said um, is when we were talking about implants, she asked if we really have free will or not, because if, if we're being tagged, I mean, I, I assume that a lot of the people being tagged are hybrids, mm -hmm. um, but what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, when you're, when you're in the spiritual plane, when you are in the, the concept and thinking of your higher self and you are offered an incarnation, you're sort of given an overview, uh, sort of a, a top level view of what does that life look like? But you are given specific details. Mm -hmm when you get incarnated you do have specific details in something called the life chart and uh, i believe the life chart allows you to have small f free will but not not big k or big k karma free will um so yes do you want to choose what major you're going to be in, in high or college uh, uh do you want to choose who you're going to marry it may or may not work out but this this chart is going to have challenges for you that meet your needs of what you wanted to learn that you hadn't learned and learned in other lifetimes. So I think we have a fair amount of free will, but I would call it a small f free will, not the big F. Um, and okay. so um, okay. you, you have guidance on your life to learn things. So if you cleared my karma, then what would happen to yes. that chart? probably not a whole lot there Darn might be it. some minor adjustments uh the, yeah yeah because uh, <laughs> a few things on that chart might might come from things that you wanted to learn or agreed to learn or needed to make up for for other lifetimes where you'd had negative interactions with other people either where you were the victim or you were the perpetrator and so things might get somewhat easier uh, that you don't have to worry about those issues anymore. Uh, I work with uh, the Council of Elders that kind of run the life chart system. And occasionally uh, when I work with a client who has many, many challenges in their life, they may have family issues, they may have job issues, they may have health issues, things like that. Sometimes I find that they also have financial challenges and I'll go and talk to the Council of Elders. I'll find that on their life chart. Yes, they do have blocks on financial success that they agree to, when they were in the spiritual plane and they were enthusiastic. Yeah, I can handle that. I can handle it. I can handle that. Oh, no, no problem. <laughs> and then they get here and their, their memory is blanked out and they suddenly find uh, the rubber meets the road and this is not what they bargained for. And so sometimes I'm able to get the life chart altered so that we might take off a challenge and just say, that can wait for another lifetime. It's, it's just too much now. Um, okay. it, it can't be accommodated at this point. Okay, so um, the, I've heard people talk about getting rid of contracts or um, agreements that you had made earlier um, and th that no longer serve. Yes. Is that, is that comparable to what you're talking about? That, that's a little bit different. Um, okay. You know, I run into a lot of people who uh, have been monks or nuns or priests uh, or, or uh, adherence to Aztec religions in other lifetimes where they, they made solemn oaths and vows and they carry that energy into this lifetime. So if they had a vow of celibacy, they find that they have sexual dysfunction or sexual problems in this lifetime. Or if they took a vow of poverty, they have a tough time making money. And so I'll walk people through subconscious scripts to disconnect from those other lifetimes uh, that those contracts and vows uh, no longer have any sway on this lifetime. They don't need to honor those. Um, you know, it could be you, you were a, a nasty, evil witch, you know, in a very dark coven worshiping Satan in another lifetime, and you made vows to Lord Satan. Uh, okay, we're going to release those. You don't need to have those dogging you in this life. This life truly should be a blank slate where you start fresh. Right, right. Well, and I assume if we're really good now that we've been really bad before, <laughs> um, which is just the way I guess it is, if you want to experience everything. So um, uh, the other questions in here, just to ask, and then I'll tell you what Shirley told me to ask, um, is um, how far back do the okay. records go? <laughs> 
How far back do the Akashic records go? I would say billions of years. I mean, the Akashic records are recording of everything that's happened, not just people's experience. And so uh, from my point of view, anything that has mass has consciousness to it in our reality. Clouds have consciousness. The bigger the cloud, the bigger the consciousness. I've talked to clouds and had them reshape themselves or even create square windows in them. Uh, there's a consciousness there. Uh, there's a consciousness in, in the air. And uh, so if you go back, you know, with the conventional thinking, what are we like 6.6 .6 billion years old, you know, or 15 billion years old for the age of the universe back to the Big Bang, uh, clearly the Akashic records would go back to that point. Okay. Uh, and, because and, they're, they're recording everything. Okay. So, and the other question was, and is it just for our planet or for the ETs too? Oh, it's for everything and everybody. Okay. And, and I also view it as being very holographic. So uh, there, there is no concept of you have to be here or you have to be there to access this record or that record. It's not a filing cabinet. It's, you know, if, with your intention, with your, um, I'll say if you remove internal subconscious blocks that, no, I can't do that. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm not, uh, I'm not spiritually advanced enough to do that when you when you get rid of those then yeah you can probably tap into the akashic records for any of those scenarios right now when we're talking about et lives you may get um you may get images visions impressions that you cannot put into context because it is so different from our concept of what a 3d world looks like so i, I have a feeling that a lot of akashic records uh just wouldn't make sense to us you know, it, it just, it, it, it's not, not in our experience uh, right. to be able to understand those. Well, a lot of times I, I feel like we don't have words. You know, so much of it's feelings. It's not really mm -hmm. words worthy, <laughs> I guess. Um, okay, so the next question was, do we have to reincarnate? No. Um, a very good example of that is uh, Sylvia Brown. She died a few years ago. Yep. Uh, her, her primary guide was Francine. And Francine's last life was something like in the 13 or 1400s. She had been uh, like the daughter of an Indian chief. And they, they were attacked by another tribe. And she took a lance through the chest and killed her. And she said, that's it, time out. I am not coming back. I will find other ways to spiritually advance, but it's not going to be incarnating in bodies. You know, I'm not going to do that one again. So uh, I, I have to believe that there, there are ways to spiritually advance and progress. Maybe they're slower. So why is there a line in order to take on a human life? Uh, I read a number of accounts of channeled stuff from ETs where they say, you can make more spiritual progress on the earth in 10 minutes than you can on our planet in a thousand years. Yeah. And earth, uh, all my explorations, earth is the roughest, toughest place in the universe. Uh, this is a boot camp. This was not ever designed to be everybody lives in Tahiti and drinks <laughs> little drinks with, you know, parasols on the beach. Earth was never intended that a few lucky people get that life, but for the vast majority, you're here to face challenges to grow. And the people who uh, refuse to face those challenges, who hide in the basement, eat pizza, play video games, drink beer, get fat and never leave mom's house. Um, you know, someday you're going to get a spiritual kick in the rear to get out there and stand up on it. And um, if you don't, you know, to a certain degree, it's going to be considered kind of a wasted life. That makes total sense. And, and uh, we have to consider that's one of the other reasons why we should honor everyone here because everyone is a, is a trooper. <laughs> every, yes, every being that, came, that decided to go to earth school um, is a champion in my, in my book. Sometimes you don't get them. You don't understand what they're doing, but that's their journey, right? Well, and, and that's why I'm, very careful on uh, my observations about religions. Yes, there, there are many organized religions which I would not participate in, um, given what I know, what I've experienced. But I honor the fact that they're there and they are at the appropriate level for the people who find benefit from them. 
Mm-hmm. Um, one of the best metaphors I ever heard from this, I just love it, is um, a guy was talking to a spiritual master one time and they were in a room and it had a window facing a, a brick wall in another building. And uh, the, uh, the beginner is talking to the master and saying something like, well, you know, it's, it's great that we're going to be up here. And the master said, no, he, he said, you don't understand. He said, look out that window, what do you see? And the guy said, well, I see a brick wall. And he said, tell me which brick on that brick wall is not essential to keep that whole brick wall up. Mm-hmm. And so it really doesn't matter if it's the brick at the bottom or the brick at the top. You know, they, they are all essential in the system of uh, where we are with spiritual ascension and growth. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of people who uh, we might say are, are fairly low functioning. A lot of people who uh, they really don't have a clue about spirituality. And that's fine. They are experiencing, they are on their life path, and they're going to grow. Right, right. The, the opposite side of that, where I think this is a concern for me, is uh, in the spiritual plane and the base layer where you go, it looks very much like suburbia, but no cars, no sidewalks, because you think yourself from here to there, everything remains perfect, nothing corrupts. But on the fringes of that, there's a gray land and it's gray and rocky and dark and there are many people there yes they qualified when they died to get into the spiritual plane but they had no concept of what the spiritual plane is and so they are stuck there kind of in the doldrums and there are a number of spiritual beings who take it on as a service task to go visit them periodically and talk to them and help them try to grow spiritually enough that they can see the true reality of the spiritual plane and participate in that paradise um if you ever saw the movie with robin williams where I just, he, he dies in an accident uh, oh yeah and, i just watch it with dreams may come i just watched it last week again dream, and, and there's one part where he steps off the boat onto a muddy shore and then he looks down and there's all these people in the mud up to their heads yeah, kind of you, looking around puzzled on the way to hell yeah. yeah very much like that yeah well they aren't even necessarily in a hell they're in a place where uh, and this is what I, I think is important to note is sort of the construct you have when you die for what your heaven looks like as a starting point is going to be that heaven. Exactly. And if you think it's pearly gates and you have to convince St. Peter to let you in that you were a good person and there's streets of gold and there's people playing harps for a lot of people, that's going to be the starting point of their heaven. And they're going to be gradually educated out of that into what the true nature of it is. Yeah. But if you don't have a concept of heaven and you wake up puzzled saying, well, who who am I? Where am I? You're you're a Bruce Willis in Sixth Sense. You know, why won't anybody talk to me? Um, You can be in a very troubled place if you don't have a concept of uh, what that heavenly space looks like when you die. I I find that that's um, very common. Uh, we talk, spoken about in the near death um, group, the mm-hmm. ions group that I'm in, that um, depending on where you are spiritually is what you go to the next stage. So you really want to, it, certainly it, towards the end of your life to start clearing up and trying to clean up your spirituality, kindness and love and, and your stuff, mm-hmm. your shadow. Well. One of my service projects that I do, uh, there's a lot of Buddhist monks who are illiterate, poorly educated, and uh, they're given a very uh, gross overview of what it's like when they die. And one of the things that they're taught is that they're going to be in a challenging place where they have to get past great big demons. And to reinforce that, they have artwork that illustrates what those demons are going to look like. Oh, wow. Well, I go in these spaces to help these little monks understand you don't have to fight the demons. You know, they're, they're all an illusion. You just step past them because oh, cool. they're convinced that they have to battle the demons and win in order to not have to reincarnate immediately. And that's that's the risk if they don't get past the demons. And so, wow. once again, they are stuck by their heartfelt concept of what it's going to be like when they, they leave the body. And uh, it truly influences what they experience. Right, right. Yeah, it's, and, and uh, religions have done such a powerful job of, of that mm-hmm. programming as well. So um, I do want to invite everyone in the audience to write down questions if they have them um, in chat 
or, um, or we're, because we'd love to enrich the conversation with, with your questions. Um, but I'm going to go to Shirley's if that's okay, Dave, unless you... Absolutely. You're okay. Okay. So <laughs> she told me to ask you about Metatron. Okay. Um, yeah. I do a lot of work with Archangel Metatron. Metatron is a curious archangel in that it doesn't show up in the, the traditional Bible. It shows up in the, uh, the Book of Enoch. And uh, the other thing is Metatron uh, comes... From, according to the background, comes from having had a human experience. Metatron did not come through a hierarchy of evolving angels. And um, where I see Metatron is, uh, is sort of like the concierge for the creator, where the creator says, I'd like to see this happen. And Metatron goes out and is the, the person or the, the spiritual being that, that makes it happen. And I worked for a long time with Archangel Michael, and I still do extensively on clearings. But um, back in 2012, I met a reader, and she said, do you know who Metatron is? And I said, I've heard the name. And she said, you need enough energy. You need to be working with Metatron directly. Uh -huh. And um, I did. And um, it's interesting, when I, when I see mediums who are uh, somewhat clairvoyant, they'll, they'll frequently, uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting, say, yeah, Metatron's behind you, and he's He's, uh, I'm seeing him from the waist where his head's touching the ceiling in, in a great big room. He said, he is huge. And uh, so, so Metatron, uh, uh, we work closely together on uh, trying to fulfill the, the creator's desires for where, where things are going. When, when you work with him, do you work with the sacred geometry also of his cube? Um, or is it mostly with him as a, as a um, assistant? Um, work with the cube, work with uh, whatever comes to mind. Somebody else I was introduced to and uh, is an adjunct to this is uh, there, there's a spiritual being named Louise and uh, Louise manages all the sacred geometries. And so I walk through what looks like warehouses full of different sacred geometries. And occasionally I'm told, Dave, you need to go stand in that one. You need some adjustments. Cool. Um, but she also shows up. Uh, th this is a very curious thing. Uh, I, I found uh, a couple of years ago that uh, occasionally when people have uh, chakras that are in bad shape, sometimes they're so damaged and they're missing pieces that I found I can do chakra transplants. And I do it with the help of spiritual beings. And uh, Louise shows up with a sacred geometry structure to put around them to uh, keep them safe and to en enable the, the chakra unit to be replaced. So, wow. uh, you know, you just keep coming across new nuggets on this stuff, it is very fascinating. Never uh, heard of Louise before, I gotta check that out. I'll, I'll have to talk to you offline about that. <laughs> so, so we are starting to get some questions in. Um, is it okay if I sure. ask if you're okay? Um, when someone works with Dave, where do yeah. they begin? How does he look at their record? Does he first look at the records and then figure that out? Um, no, I, I actually have a worksheet. Uh, a lot of people, when we're talking about past lives, uh, one of the common things is, um, have my husband and I been together in a past life? And uh, I actually have a, a little structure on my worksheet that I fill in and I look at how many lifetimes they've had together and then I split it down to how many as a couple or a parent, child or siblings or friends. And then uh, we drill down farther and I started getting uh, the, the year where they were together, who's who, how old they were when they died, the challenges in that life what was the family profession. Uh, so I, I get that stuff because a lot of times I see trends in uh, relationships of, of people from their past lives up to the present one, you know, and uh, in most cases, you hope that it's a gradually increasing trend, but sometimes I'll see where they experiment where one person was a male and the other one was a female, and uh, that didn't work at all. And then the other one was a male and the other one's a female. Uh, that worked better. So that's what they continued in this lifetime uh, because that energy works better. One of the interesting things about that uh, when I'm looking at two people being together is most of the time they run out of energy after five, five times together. Uh, 
every once in a while, rarely, I get a six or a seven, but most of the time uh, it's five and done. Uh, there, there's not much more to learn after being together five times. Oh, that's interesting. Five is the number of change also. That's so interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, Holly's asking, can you talk about ISIS? Can you talk about the violet flame and its effectiveness in clearing? So I guess it's two things, ISIS and then the violet flame. Sure. Um, th that will open up, you know, I, I can't ever talk about something simply. So um, <laughs> Isis is a goddess. Right. And uh, uh, I, I work with the goddess, gods and goddesses. I, just like the, the kingdom of God has different realms. It has the realm of people and incarnate beings like ETs, which we're, we're all closely related. It also has the angelic realm. Uh, it also has the realm of gods and goddesses. And this realm was originally created to help man, mankind, person, kind, whatever, um, evolve and develop civilization, develop, you know, the capability to live independently. Um, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical that without outside help, that suddenly 10,000 years ago, uh, a bunch of people running around who had no reading or writing and had a short lifespan suddenly developed a uh, they, they hybridized wheat and oats and barley. They, uh, they hybridized uh, inedible fruits into real edible fruit trees. They, they domesticated all kinds of animals, all the common animals. And they did this where most people today, even if you know it can be done, would be challenged in a, in a long lifetime to, to make that happen, to just say, okay, here's a bunch of grass seed. I want you to hybridize that you know, over your life in order to make an edible grain. And, yeah. You know, and, and here these people are living at the age of, you know, ripe old age of 25 or 26. So we had outside help. I, I'm just going to say we, we had outside help. And a lot of these were the gods and goddesses. Only they view themselves as just being advanced spiritual beings who could help. Right. It was the people that they were helping who developed a worship tradition and put them up on a pedestal and said, you know, there must be something very special about them because they can come and go. They disappear and uh, they, they have all this knowledge. Uh, I think the mythology that we get out of the Greek mythology and the Roman mythology and the Norse mythology, um, those are morality plays uh, that were created. Um, I've actually worked directly with Medusa to help her change her subconscious core beliefs to get away from all of this negative stuff that's put on her. Uh, the story about snake hair and turning men to stone and being evil and all that is all a bunch of nonsense. I, uh -huh. I've, I've, I've worked with a, a trans medium who... Uh, Medusa came through and I worked directly with Medusa as a client. I mean, th this is kind of strange. Uh, <laughs> but these... Uh, you have to write a book. Oh my gosh, you have to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> these gods and goddesses uh, do exist. And in the past several years, uh, I've been working with Athena, who's kind of leading a group of about 300 goddesses and getting everything prepped for them to actually start showing up physically back on the planet and helping. Now, a lot of them are going to be masked or cloaked or disguised, uh, but they want to get reinvolved. Uh, again, you know, we're, we're approaching this big major uh, step uh, forward uh, in evolution and everybody wants to participate. Um, now, talking about the violet flame, uh, the violet flame I work with a lot is uh, uh, St. Germain and uh, uh, the energy of alchemy. Um, there are different people have different concepts and structures of the violet flame. Uh, I don't really particularly use that in my energy and entity clearing work. I, I have other techniques and other uh, other ways I work with it in a, in a more engineering construct. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I use the decrees every day. So... Uh, St. Germain's decrees the blue book every day. So, mm -hmm. okay, so great. Uh, so um, can I go on to the next one? Do you mind, do you ready for the firing squad here? Please do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Lori wants to know, what about the quantum void and the notion of nothingness behind physical phenomena? Um, absolutely. Um, here's one of those things that I've discovered in, in my spiritual journey and questing 
Um, a lot of people are concerned about uh, what does it mean to, to reach the top in Buddhism? And uh, you would say, well, that's enlightenment, but they also talk about uh, essentially going to nothingness or going to the void. And in uh, one of my transcendental uh, or transcendent experiences, uh, I did go into the void and now I repeatedly go into the void because uh, rather than seeing the void as nothingness, I see the void as being a container that has all possibility and all energy and is sort of the building blocks of what we do to manifest for the creator. So I don't see the void as, uh, yes, there is no thing there, nothing, there's no thing, but I also see it as being a sandbox and you can uh, construct there. And just because you don't have uh, a container doesn't mean you don't still have a consciousness. Um, there are a lot of very evolved spiritual beings who have reintegrated with the creator, but they can re-manifest out of that if they're needed uh, to do a task or to inspire, or they can be copied and their, their consciousness can be sent out. So, you know, can we have 10,000 Jesuses, 100,000, a million Jesuses? Yeah, no problem. Um, you know, the, the void is unlimited in, in what it can do in, in producing that. So rather than, um, well, I, I see a fundamental fear for, mo for most people, uh, and it's a fear that leads to all the fears, is the idea that when you die, nothing continues to exist. And, and I see that as being the ultimate fear for many, many, many people. And uh, therefore, if you, uh, why do some people go over the edge if you, uh, lay them off from a job well the logical conclusion is if you lay them off they can't pay the rent they can't buy food they're going to starve to death they're going to die and they're not going to exist survival. anymore so it gets right. you back to the fundamental fear which is when i die nothing will exist anymore of me and uh except for some memories which will fade after a generation or two i will be totally out of the picture you know rather than uh, a spiritual concept that yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I may lose the physical body, but I still continue energetically and I'll be in other planes. Uh, but a lot of people have a hard time because that doesn't look like a 3D existence. They have a hard time uh, accepting that. And so their, their biggest fear is when I die, nothing more will exist of me. Right. And I think that was a lot of the um, changes that were happening last March during, at the very beginning of the lockdown was there was a lot of people having to having to admit or work on their fears of death because here there was this invisible enemy right okay i hope you're still there yeah yeah oh good <laughs> okay you you just stop for a second so um, this was, um, I want you to, uh, Karen had asked about if there would be a possibility tonight for someone on the call to experience your work or a group information message. If, there, if you could tap in, there's uh, 10, 11 of us here, um, including you. So um, I don't know, do you, do you want to, do a do a process at all if i if i do a brief one um uh, i just see if, if a, uh, for me it'd be more snippets of information rather than uh, uh, a long dialogue or long monologue uh, well it's up to you whatever's yeah. easiest i can put us back uh, on view so you can see everyone and you could tap in if you'd like or we kind of sprung this no, on you. It, it, here's, here's the impressions I get. I'll, I'll do it by impressions. The impressions I get uh, from these spiritual beings are uh, get out of the place of fear. Uh, there's really nothing to fear. You know, there's, they're laughing. They're saying, what's the worst that can happen? You die. <laughs> so what? It's not a big deal. It's, it's dropping your overcoat in, in, on the train tracks and moving on. Uh, so it's, it's get out of the place of fear. Uh, they're just saying everybody's being manipulated now. 
by, by many people who are trying to put you off track. Um, it's, you know, don't, don't fall prey to uh, the fear mongers, the ones who um, basically they're short circuiting your spiritual development by putting you in a place of fear. And so it's uh, get out of that. Uh, I'm also hearing, uh, trying to cut down on studying up on conspiracy, conspiracy theories. Um, you know, they're, they're a dime a dozen and uh, many of them are contradictory and to yeah. hitch, hitch your wagon to one or another uh, is, is very limiting rather than uh, going within. I'm hearing the words, you know, uh, seek, seek the kingdom of God within. Uh, that's the, the, the key thing here. And uh, don't let other people t you know, tell you what to think or what to feel on, on spirituality. Uh, this is a personal journey. It's uh, your personal connection with the creator. Uh, it's, it's time for you to, to go there. It's okay to seek advice or interpretation. Um, but, you know, they're... they're <laughs> They're reminded of that old joke. I think my karma just ran over your dogma, and uh, so they're they're saying, uh, you, you know, don't 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 get stuck into things. The best you can do if you're talking about spirituality is to use a, a 3D reality to try to describe something that's higher dimensional. It's going to fail. Uh, do the best you can, but don't be dogmatic that this one is right, that one's wrong. Um, they both may be describing the exact same thing. They have different images and different pictures. And don't let somebody else tell you that you're wrong on the impressions you get when you journey. Um, over time, you may refine it. You may go to a higher level. Uh, they're reminding me of the thing I read in, in uh, Joseph Campbell, where one of the philosophers he quoted said, um, you know, it's a great thing when you're uh, killing off your gods over and over. And the idea there is as you grow spiritually, maybe discarding the the more say, oh no, connection. So they're all just saying. Hang in there, you know, shoot for working with the divine directly and uh, to, to know that energy and uh, quit letting other people tell you what to think or do. Yeah. So, Perfect. yeah, that's that's Perfect. what's coming through. Perfect. So um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, the, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, I look forward to hearing more from the your team. Uh, because I think you have a, a tremendous um, support team. <laughs> um, okay, oh. so yeah. So, um, so the other question is: um, Have you ever heard of Joseph's Joseph Communication Soul Group out of England with Michael Reccia? No, I, I can't say that I have. Okay, Noel, do you want to want to? talk about this real quick no. so that he can learn? Noel? Uh, yeah, um, let me see, I'm going to, uh, yeah, this is a group that brought through eight books. It's a soul group. And um, I just was kind of smiling to myself because when you were talking about what happens, you know, after death and about reincarnation, we were just listening to uh, his audio book today. In fact, I have it here. Uh -huh. Cool. Uh, your life after death and everything was just ex expressed a little bit differently but basically mm -hmm, not much <laughs> the same information um you know the mm -hmm. different uh metaphors or you know like that but the the basic information was just right on and um uh, uh, I'm actually, I'm giving away, if anybody wants a set of books, I give them away free. I've been gifted them by Michael Rachel and the Joseph communication group. And, um, cool. uh, so all I have to know is your mailing address and I'll send a set of books. So, um, 
uh, but anyway, I just found it really interesting. Bob, didn't you think the same thing? Yeah, I did. And um, also that um, your, your comments about immediately after death being disoriented or, you know, the, needing someone to guide a soul after the, immediately after they've left their body and that sort of thing. That was the chapter we were listening to today was aligned exactly like that. That's great. What, cool. Yeah, what, what you were what, yeah. what you were saying. It's always kind of nice to get cross confirmations because, uh, you know, what do I know? The, the Joseph <laughs> yeah. communication. Um, the Joseph communications have also said just in the last like forty eight hours that we're in an extremely special time right now uh, through the early part of uh, early so May third. Um, There's alignment. Kind of a supercharged time of of. Um, angels and 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 guide groups and whatnot assisting us on the planet do you have dave do you consider there to be anything particularly significant going on in this period of time about humanity's advancement or evolution any more so than three weeks ago or three weeks from now this is just like a whole bunch of flowers i i'm i'm watching all the tulip bulbs and, and you know, they all have buds and day by day, I see more and more uh, blooms. Um, I just think we're being so primed. I, I was gonna say, uh, what, one of the things I do in sessions with people is uh, I have a spiritual gift worksheet it has about 30 categories and I muscle test to identify those areas that people can most easily develop if they choose. What are their latent gifts? One of those is clear audience and I would say Gosh, maybe eight out of 10 people that I work with are testing very high on clear audience. And a lot of people don't know what it looks like. Uh, so for listeners, clear audience for most people who have it is your voice in your head, just like when you're reading a book. When you, when you read something, you sound it out in your head. It's just like you're reading to yourself. If you ask a question and in that voice it's answered and you know you didn't create the answer, or if that voice says, look out up ahead, you're getting clear audience inputs. Many, many people are getting this and many people don't realize it. They, they just look at me and they say, oh, is that what that is? Uh, so I'm just telling you, uh, I, I think we're all being primed for that. I'm also finding many people are showing up with telepathy is becoming very strong. Uh, and again, I think this is one of the spiritual gifts to help people, excuse me, uh, realize uh, their oneness with others, their connection to others, and you get it through telepathy, but your, your oneness with the creator, however you envision that concept, uh, I think that's coming through in terms of the clear audience. Um, your subconscious is being primed, your heart chakra is being primed to be a very clear channel for this, and it's happening for many, many people. And I would say in terms of what's going on right now, I would say we're, we're zooming on all of this, uh, especially as people are getting burned out on so many other things of the, the 3D world. You know, What's it supposed to look like financially? Am I going to get my stimulus check? Uh, am I still gonna have my job? You know, can, I, can I keep my house? You know, what are my kids learning in school? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, uh, I need some inspiration. And I think if people just, uh, don't call it meditation. You know, meditation is a turn off for a lot of people. Just uh, sit quietly for a moment. Just say, I know there's a spiritual being who wants to talk to me. And I set the intention. I will only talk to high vibration beings. Please give me a message. And probably most of you are going to get something right away. You're saying, what took you so damn long? About time you ask. <laughs> you know, so um, it's being turned on. It's being activated for people. And a lot of people don't know what to expect, so they don't know how to name it or describe it. Perfect. Well, I, I have another Thank question. Um, has humanity really evolved? I mean, our technology and things have evolved, but it seems like there's just a history, you know, we just kill and kill and kill. And, you know, it seems like this is we're on a slaughterhouse planet. And I'm just wondering, is the consciousness really shifting? as we well, like it, to think it is. Here's my view on that. So number one is uh, I believe that uh, we're not with the same creator who's at the beginning. Uh, I believe that we're working with creator number seven. 
uh, the creator itself evolves and moves on and other uh, spiritual beings take on that role. Uh, I've talked to creator number one and talked about the concept of why evil. And uh, I've actually gone and see the, the entity or the energy called the source of all evil. Um, evil was created so that we'd have something that was separate from us. You know, we always get that separateness here on, on this planet uh, that we would have something to give us a challenge. Uh, rather than just looking in other people's defects to say, I'm challenged, you know, I, I worship God better than you because my hat is bigger than yours. Uh, you know, and, and that's my interpretation of the rules of keeping your head covered to worship God, you know, that kind of nonsense. Uh, so there, there's a separate and objective evil out there. Uh, on the evil meter, I believe it was set up uh, originally to be like a 3% level and uh, when I started working with it and trying to reduce it, it's at 30%. It, it was corrupt. And uh, I found that uh, one of the, uh, I, I view Satan as an archetype. That's actually a costume worn by a spiritual being. And uh, one of the, the Satans was uh, uh, let things get out of control, so to speak. Uh, it went far beyond what it should have. And what I call the mid-level managers got way too powerful. And so there are steps in place to try to correct that. So, um, there's that part going on. I, I think the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, if, um, if I look out my window and I see two guys fighting in the street and I see one pull a gun and shoot the other, um, I'm not going to immediately assume that one's a good guy and one's a bad guy. I need to look at what's going on. There are, uh, there are people who have the free will choice on whether they're going to be good or bad you know, or make mistakes, you know, choose the hard road, so to speak. There are other people who spiritually agree to come in to be the bad guy, to give the experience that somebody else needs. So there could be two best friends in the spiritual plane. And one says, I want to find out what it's like to be a sexually abused child. And would you come in and be the, the funny uncle who does this to me? And the other one says, well, I know I'll be hated and despised if I do it, but for you, since you want this learning experience, I'll come in and I'm going to be the nastiest, meanest uh, abuser that you've ever seen. But just keep that in mind when we come back here, I'm your best friend. And so does that person incur karma for being the sex abuser to that child? No, it's part of the plan for that person, that soul to have that experience and to grow through that experience. You know, somebody had to do it for them to have that experience. So when I explain this to people, a lot of times it helps them find resolution that you know, if their mother or father was their abuser, um, you know, it's like, wow, that's a whole different way to view it, that uh, somebody came in and took on that role to help me learn and grow and have this experience to round out my education. So um, there, there are some horrible people out there on, you know, and they show up in the news and everything. Uh, that, it doesn't necessarily mean that they come in with the plan to do that. And they're fulfilling their spiritual path just as we're fulfilling ours. They're giving us challenges. They're, they're giving us something to work against. Mm. Fascinating. Hmm. When, when does a soul come into a being? Do they choose like after born? Oh, good question. Conception. And when do they leave? Do they leave at the time the body leaves? Um, Souls uh, can come into the body uh, anytime during uh, pregnancy, sometimes during uh, development, they, they come and go a couple of times. They kind of get a test feel. And um, sometimes they do this test check and they think that they're good. And then they find towards delivery that things don't fit. They aren't right. It's too late to get another soul in there. And uh, the baby ends up being uh, stillborn or dies shortly after death because it really doesn't have a soul in it. Uh, there are some souls that come into the baby after the baby is actually physically born. Uh, the baby survives by a, inertia of the phys physiological system, but there's no soul in it at the actual moment of birth when it emerges from the mother's body. And then the soul comes in shortly after. So uh, it's, it's quite variable. And uh, although I'm, I'm not a believer of using abortion as routine birth control, the flip side of that is every soul that's going to come in and be born is going to find a way. And, uh, you know, you, you could have uh, many pregnancies terminated and yet that soul is still going to find uh, a child to come into. So it's not like 
wow, that was the one shot that God gave you and boom, you ended up in the <laughs> trash can. Too bad. So sorry. No, it, it doesn't work that way. No. It doesn't work that way at all. Um, uh, and then, wait, wait. And then what about the outro? <laughs> when they, you know, do they leave before the body takes its last breath? Or do they leave um, a week before? Sometimes. Uh, I will say this for the people who are afraid that, you know, if I was going to be tortured to death, if I was going to be burned alive, if I was going to be for uh, minutes or tens of minutes, um, the spiritual plane has a merciful way to get you out of that. And so even though the body may appear to be reacting, the soul may be standing to the side, watching and saying, oh my goodness, look what it's going through. Can't you make it stop? And they say, what do you care? You aren't in that body. That is just the body's physiological response. There is no animating soul in that body anymore. Uh, one of the best stories I read about something like this was uh, years ago, I read a book uh, by a medium and uh, this was a guy and he went to the airport to catch a flight and he got to the boarding area and he started looking around and everybody looked two dimensional. They were not three dimensional. And he said, something is terribly wrong here. And he made an excuse, canceled the flight, got off. And sure enough, the plane went down and they lost everybody. So the souls were already pulling out of those bodies before they even boarded the airplane. So, um, you know, for, for the people who are afraid of, you know, having a painful death that it does, uh, horrific things to them psychologically. Um, the, the spiritual plane is very compassionate on, on our experience here and uh, they, they take care of it one way or another. So uh, I, I would uh, release that fear. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So um, the sure. other, there is a question from Flo. Um, she says, do you believe that the point of evolution mankind is at, na is at now? Is the highest evolution mankind has been, been seen over the millennia or have we lost information over the years? I, I think we've, uh, we've had a couple waves of people on this planet that have come and gone and uh, the planet has changed enough that we've lost all trace of those. Uh, I certainly believe that there was an Atlantis and that it was an advanced civilization and that ultimately uh, they kind of got bored and burned out and started doing some very morally corrupt things. Uh, I, I think the one of the traces we have of Atlantis are, are the concepts we have in mythology of half man, half beast creations. Uh, I think Atlantis was screwing around with that and created those things and used them either as slaves or as a game for hunting. So they had like very intelligent animals to go out and hunt, you know, like centaurs and fawns and things. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's part of uh, some of the story of why they, they ultimately their, their civilization was consumed. And I think there may have been some others. Um, and another very interesting thing is uh, you look at the Egyptian pyramids and it looks like they de evolved. It looks like at one point they were at the pinnacle of how to build a great pyramid. And then the ones after that ended up getting uh, poor and poor design, they, they lost the, the secret sauce, uh, which would also point that there's something there uh, either on external help or uh, that they, they devolved there. As an engineer, the problem I have with uh, a lot of stuff in society is the idea that just, we can't, just because we can do it, we should do it. Uh, for example, uh, it really bothered me terribly when they said, we think we ought to go find some bodies frozen in the Arctic of people who died during the Spanish flu so that possibly we can recover the virus from the Spanish flu to study it. And it's like, wait a second, this killed 50 million people. You want to go find some live virus to screw around in a lab with just because you can? There, There is no moral perspective on what are the ramifications of this. And sure enough, they went out and they did it, you know, and... Uh, I, I'm absolutely convinced that there are labs, you know, are possibly in our countries, certainly in other countries that are uh, cloning humans routinely. And uh, why are they doing it? Because they can, you know, and uh, are they uh, building genes from the base pairs up to do specific things? Uh, 
and splice those into people's uh, DNA you know, on some of these experiments? Probably, absolutely, because they can. And, and you know, without this moral perspective, you know, it's, um, I mean, the first time we were really confronted with that was uh, the atomic bomb. And, you know, Einstein tried to say, oh, my goodness, you know, please don't do that. And, um, you know, the, the government, for whatever reasons, felt they had their back against the wall in the war with Japan, and they, they went ahead and did it. And they used it twice. And hopefully we'll never use it again. I also believe my heart of hearts that uh, our, our space brothers would uh, interfere that. and disable uh, anybody who attempted to use a weapon to take out a population center at this point. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I think they would interfere. So, but have we lost the information or do, or do you feel, I mean, I, I'm, I, I would like to be optimistic that we came, we stood in line to get these bodies to be here right now to help with turning around the ship. Is that unrealistic? Um, I, I think we're going to make uh, we are being pressed very hard, essentially, to stand up and be counted on what our morality looks like. You know, do we leave anybody behind? You know, do do we are we compassionate to the lowest of the low? Uh, those types of things. And I, I think uh, the Earth situation is be, being set up so uh, people have a chance to stand up and be counted. And uh, if you duck your responsibility on uh, your, your moral obligation to, you know, help others. Um, yeah, I think um, you may uh, devolve and, and go to another uh, uh, vibrational level. And it's not that it's the hell, it's just one that's more suitable for your way of thinking and not to uh, sort of self-select, sort of like the Harry Potter sorting hat, you know, are you going to be in Slytherin or are you going to be in Gryffindor? You know, <laughs> uh, it's up to you. What kind of person are you? Right, right. Oh, well, um, I, I still want to, maybe it's Pollyanna, but I think that's why so many of us are here right now having conversations like this is to um, up level as much as possible and get people to not be victimized by what's mm -hmm. happening and pick up their sovereignty and and stand for themselves. Well, I, I think it's getting to that acknowledgement and feeling of oneness. And a lot of people don't have that, but I'd love to see that more. I, I joke with people about, you know, why do I do healing? Well, it's one of the most selfish things I can do because when I make somebody else feel better, I feel better. Right. You know, I feel that connection to them. I, I hurt when they hurt. And, uh, we just need more people to wake up to that fact that they are connected to the others. And, uh, you know, we, we are, we either all fly together, or we all sink together. Uh, right. you know, it's, it's not, uh, I fault the media and, and the sports for so much for, for, uh, focusing on individual achievement. And if you aren't a big dog, don't get off the porch and you're number one and all this, and this false sense of I'm, you know, as an individual, you know, I, I'm the supreme thing rather than saying, look around you for somebody to help to give a hand, you, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who aren't going to be as accomplished as you and a whole lot of things, help them realize their potential, help them right. have, have happiness, help them succeed, you know, uh, so, so what if you have all these special gifts? How are you using them to help others? Right. So I, I think that's the big challenge for us. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much, Dave. I put for everyone that's interested in working with Dave, I put his website, his email, and his phone number in the chat. And I hope that, um, that you will go to his website and see all the amazing things that he does. He also, we didn't even mention it, he was one of the first people on Blog Talk Radio. So he has a radio show that, um, how many years have you been doing it? Uh, over 10 now. I, I have over 520 shows now. And uh, so Dave has interviewed all of the big names, all the greats. And um, so not only is he a wealth of information from his own studies, he's um, he's been 
following amazing beings all these years. So Dave, is there one last thing that you'd like to, uh, to say to, to leave us with? Uh, we, we really appreciate your, your insights. I would just say, uh, you know, Earth is a great place to live on. It's fun. Uh, and by doing it perfectly right, you know, things like that. Enjoy the experience. The Creator puts you here to experience, to have a chance to co-create, and uh, take advantage of that. Uh, go out and try new things, even if you're gonna mess up. Who cares? Go out and try new things. Uh, live it up. You know, enjoy it. Uh, don't don't get all caught up into is this the moral thing to do? You know, just uh, does it feel good? Does it feel right? Are you helping? You know, yeah, go for it. Have fun. Okay, so have fun. That's that's pretty uh, much the co-creators convergence way. Great. So I want to take this moment on behalf of the co-creators convergence to thank you so much, Dave and Kathy. You have just brought it tonight. Uh, how am I going to get to sleep? I'm so excited. You know? <laughs> thank you. Party thank day, you. But I love it. Love it. Yeah. So thank you so much. And uh, we will have this. We're going to edit out a few things, uh, put this together. It'll Everyone can find this if you want to listen to the replay because the wisdom was fast and furious. So we will have that on our website, cocreatorsconvergence.com and also on the Facebook page. So thank you, Dave, so much. If anybody wants to thank unmute, you. we really, really appreciate it. This has been. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you. Noel. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Lori. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Marty. <laughs> thank you, Marty. Thank you for yeah. your energy, people. Yes, thank you. Join us on April 22nd when Ron and Victoria Friedman of the Vistar Foundation share the wisdom of Dr. Kenneth G. Mills telling that the prime reason for your appearance here is to give the earth back to the arms of love.